time as a professor emeritus here because he served 28 years on the faculty of the University of Iowa's College of Dentistry, retiring in 2007 as associate professor. He's published five articles in the Journal of History of Dentistry, and he currently serves as a historian for Old Capitol Chorus in Iowa City and for the Central States District of the Barbershop Harmony Society, which has more than 2,000 members. He sings bass in a barbershop quartet. And if any of you are going to take in the performance of Brigadoon coming up, you'll find he's also going to be performing in that uh, theatrical performance. Today he's going to teach us about railroads in Iowa City, not just the Rock Island Railroad, but the plug lines and the inner urbans and all the other transit uh, methods that people used in Iowa City. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Shuline. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Very nice of you. We've got quite a bit to cover today, so I'm going to get started right away. And we're going to talk about a lot of things on the railroad, which has played quite a prominent role in the history of Iowa City over the past over 150 years. And in fact, 150 years going from steam to electric to diesel powered. If I can get the right buttons here, here we go. Okay, I'll begin way back in the mid 1800s when the first locomotive limped silently in Iowa City at the old depot on Johnson Street. This is an example of a railroad of that era. Following this, two more railroads came along with one of them fading away before its rails were even laid. Shortly after the dawn of the 20th century, two electric rail systems came into being. And I'll discuss how you can still catch a train into Iowa City from Coralville during the fall. And finally, I'll talk about a proposal for renewed passenger service to and from Iowa City. It was a cold day in Iowa City, Iowa in December, late in 1855. The city was very anxious for something to arrive before the new year would come. Iowa City was still a fledgling town and a fledgling state. Although far from the geographical center of the state, it was the capital. State lawmakers came from afar to attend legislative sessions. They came on horseback, by horse and buggy, by stagecoach. Had their setting been out east, they may have come by rail or water canal. But the railroad had not yet come to Iowa City. Here we see Clinton Street in downtown Iowa City in the year 1856. Railroads were so important to the growth and commerce of a town that there was often competition as each town tried to entice the railroad to come its way. Such a rivalry existed between Muscatine and Iowa City in 1855, with each vying for the Mississippi and Missouri Railroad, which had been organized in October of 1852. Iowa City was chosen to be on the main east-west line of the M&M, and so anxious was Iowa City for its coming that a $50,000 prize was offered to the railroad if it would complete its line into town before the arrival of 1856. But there was a problem. On December 25th, the rails were still two and one half miles from Iowa City. As December 31st drew near, it was apparent that the rail line would not be finished on time for the capturing of the prize, of the bonus. At 9 p.m. on the 31st, the rails were still about one and a quarter miles from the station. It was bitterly cold and bonfires were burning to provide both warmth and light for the desperate workers. Through their heroic efforts, the workers managed to get within 75 yards of the depot by 11 p.m. Many Iowa City residents turned out to pitch in to complete the task. But as midnight drew near, the steam-powered engine froze up and came to a standstill. <laughs> a feeling of despair must have set in as everyone realized that the goal would not be attained. But then, someone thought of using pinch bars, great big heavy metal iron bars. As men inched the locomotive forward, turning the wheels with these heavy bars, the time grew ever so near, but as the church bells rang in the new year, the engine had been moved to the station, thus bringing the drama to a successful close. And I got behind. There is the old station that was on Johnson Street, about oh, a quarter to a half a mile east of the present station. Here is a mural by a Mildred Pelzer depicting the arrival of the locomotive on New Year's Eve in 1855. Was this just in the nick of time arrival of the train of fabrication? One prominent Iowa City historian has said so, but I don't know about that. I, ha I haven't found any evidence of that. Sure makes for a dramatic story. 
in the 1878-1879 Iowa City Directory, it was recalled that the railway people, reinforced by the whole town, laid temporary ties and rails, enabling the iron horse to reach Iowa City promptly on time. But in any event, on January 3rd, despite the minus 20 degree temperature, a special train load of guests from Davenport and the East was cheered on as these people arrived on the new railroad. Three bands played, the guests were escorted to the old Capitol, or it was called the Capitol building then, and an elaborate supper was served in the evening. Here's what the United States railroad system looked like by the year 1850. You can see that a fairly extensive railroad of rail lines was already in place in the eastern and southeastern parts of the United States. But in 1840, there were almost 3,000 miles of track. Ten years later, over 9,000 miles. Then by 10 more years, it jumped to over 30,000 miles. In the first few years after the railroad arrived, the population of Iowa City more than doubled. The census showed 1,250 in 1850 and 5,200 or so in 1860. Along with this, there was a sharp increase in real estate values. Here's what a typical steam locomotive looked like in 1855. These are depictions of the interiors of the nicer passenger cars of the day. It wasn't long before a bridge over the Mississippi River was completed, thereby linking the Mississippi and Missouri Railroad with the Chicago and Rock Island Railroad, thus allowing for travel between the East Coast and Iowa City. But Iowa City was the western terminus of the line. Even by 1860, five years later, the railroad only extended across the Iowa River to Oxford, and until 1865, Iowa City was the principal western stopping point for rail transportation. Stepping back a few years, in 1857, the Mississippi and Missouri ran two passenger trains and two freight trains each way on a daily basis between Iowa City and Rock Island. At Rock Island, the train connected with the Chicago and Rock Island Railroad for Chicago and the eastern cities with no change of cars between Iowa City and Chicago. I'd like to mention that in 1857, there was still a need for stagecoach service in Iowa City, and the city indeed had such service. Coaches left every day for Fort Des Moines, Cedar Rapids, and Washington. Then they went beyond to Council Bluffs, Dubuque, Waterloo, Oskaloosa, and Fairfield. Do any of you recognize these three small houses on South Dubuque Street, about one half block from the Rock Island Railroad Depot? They are said to have been built in 1859. I was told that Mrs. Wilfrida Hieronymus told the present shop owner, shown, shown here, he's not shown here, is he? There, there he is, but that was supposed to be the next one, that the homes were used as stagecoach stopovers. Even after the arrival of the railroad in 1855, the stagecoaches were still in need for north-south travel things that weren't on the route of the main east-west line. Stagecoaches were, were in use in Iowa till at least 1870. The owner also said the, that horses were stabled in the basement via the back door here. Here is an image taken from one of Irving Weber's books of the first railroad bridge across the Iowa River in Iowa City. This bridge was not completed until 1860, more than four years after the railroad reached Iowa City from the east. And this is a bird's eye view of Iowa City in the 1860s, showing the first depot at Johnson Street. It would be uh, here. The present one would be down here on Wright Street. The worldwide panic of 1857 and problems within the management of the railroad had slowed the building progress of the rail line. It wasn't until 1869, a day or two after the driving of the Golden Spike in Promontory Point, Utah, that the rail line was completed from Iowa City all the way to Council Bluffs. In 1869, the fast Pacific Express ran from Chicago to Council Bluffs in 18 hours, averaging 27 and a half miles an hour. For the next few years after 1855, there would be at least two entities that would be thankful for the existence of this new railroad. A group of immigrant religious converts who would push or pull their way westward using hand carts, and an infamous abolitionist and his followers who would soon arrive in Iowa City. 
So now people could avail themselves of the comforts of travel by rail. They could sit back as their train plowed ahead at a maximum of 20 miles per hour with soot and smoke everywhere. They would stop frequently to take on water. If they came from afar, they could look forward to spending the overnight hours sitting up or putting up in a warehouse or a barn. <clears throat> Sanitation facilities were primitive. Passengers would provide their own food or pick it up along the way. Schedules were erratic. There might be a boiler explosion, but if the passengers were lucky, the boiler would be thrown upward and forward of the locomotive as it moved along. They might experience a derailment. And there were problems with slowing and stopping strains as brakemen risked their lives atop boxcars, keeping their balance and ducking obstructions as they turned the braking wheels. There might even be screams of horror as rail workers were squeezed between cars while attempting to couple them together. So it wasn't all roses. In the late 1850s, iron rails were three and one half inches high, and they weighed about 56 pounds per yard. These rails would break, so track walkers patrolled the lines, I think especially in winter, during both night and day. In comparison, a century later, steel rails were perhaps five inches high and weighed between 80 and 90 pounds per yard, and a lot more in some cases. Rails differ in weight just based upon the, the size of the trains, the frequency of the trains that traverse the rails. During April, May, and June of 1856, that was about a half year after the railroad came, some 1,300 European immigrants arrived at the Iowa City train depot. Perhaps this scene depicts their earlier arrival at New York Harbor. These were Mormon people who still had a 1,400 mile journey ahead of them before they would arrive at Salt Lake City. The first Mormons to arrive made the trek before that, with, but with the help of wagons. But these people in the latter group, or later group, were poor, and the church could not afford to outfit them with wagon trains, so the idea of the handcart was born. A number of markers in Coralville and a namesake road in Iowa City commemorate the time that the Mormons spent here. Here's the bronze sculpture that's near the Marriott Hotel at the Iowa River Landing in Coralville. And this is a plaque commemorating the handcart emigration. It's located further south on Mormon Trek Boulevard in the Mormon Handcart cart Park. I realize you can't read the print, just to show you that, though. The Fugitive Slave Act was passed in 1850, and Uncle Tom's Cabin was published in 1852. In 1857, the Dred Scott decision was handed down, declaring slaves to be property. These events all added to the racial tensions already in the air and gave rise to increased abolitionist fervor. Arguably the most famous zealot was John Brown. In March of 1859, Brown came through Iowa City with a group of 12 liberated slaves taken from Kansas. And on the morning of March 10th, the first eastbound train out of Iowa City dropped off an empty boxcar on a siding near a mill in West Liberty. The liberated families were loaded into the freight car and later in the morning, the car was coupled with another eastbound train and eventually made its way to Detroit, soon after into Freedom in Windsor, Ontario, Canada. By the 1870s, close to 24 different gauges of track were in use in the United States. Gauges measured uh, a measure of the distance between the rails. By 1886, almost all trains were running on a gauge of four feet, eight and one half inches, which was adopted from the British system. Many locomotives had been imported from England. In the south, though, the standard gauge was five feet, but the southern rail lines were converted to the standard gauge by 1886. This limestone tunnel was reportedly built by the owners of the Mississippi and Missouri Railroad for the purposes of water drainage. Does anyone know where this tunnel is? Maggie, you've seen it? Right. But not right, that's right. It probably dates to the mid-1800s when the rail line came through. Do any of you know what nickname has been ascribed to this structure? It's called Dead Man's Cave, and it can be accessed from an alley off of Jackson Street on this side and from the north side of Pine Street on the other side. Here's the Pine Street side where it's a little obscured here in the view. I've heard two legends 
pertaining to the naming of Dead Man's Cave. One has it that a person was shot in the passageway, and the other subscribes to the belief that the roof of the tunnel collapsed, killing someone. Neither one really sounds very plausible to me, but that's what I've heard. From this 1875 Iowa City directory entry, we can see that Chicago time and Iowa City time differed by 17 minutes. <laughs> In 1883, standard time was adopted, and on November 18th of that year, the country was divided into the four time zones that we have today. So we have learned that travel on the early rail lines was far from luxurious, but advancements were rapid. One that I got to thinking about here, the fact that they went from wood burning to coal burners. I wondered if that was really an advancement in that down at Mount Pleasant at Old Thresher's they made them stop using coal and go to wood because of all the soot that the poor people in Mount Pleasant were complaining about all the time. So, But anyway, also lighting in the passenger cars had gone from candles to coal oil lamps to gas in that era. And by the late 1860s, steel rails manufactured by the Bessemer process were beginning to replace the less satisfactory iron rails. Also in 1869, sleeping cars were introduced. Pullman wasn't the only company that produced them, but probably the most famous one that we know. As a side note, when company founder George Pullman died in 1890, Abraham Lincoln's son Robert Todd Lincoln took over as president of the company. And I have a little side story that I must tell regarding the Pullman cars. A friend of mine, he's now 93, took a ride on a Pullman sleeper car with his family sometime in the 1950s. They encountered bed bugs. <laughs> when my friend returned home, he wrote the company a letter expressing his displeasure. He received a nice letter back assuring him that the matter was being investigated, insisting that all would be taken care of. He happened to turn the letter over and there printed in pencil was this, send this SOB the bed bug letter. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I, I hope I haven't offended the Pullman Company as I'm merely reporting what I think are the facts. Anyway. Dining cars were introduced about the same time that the sleepers were, and there were two very significant developments in about the 1870s. The adoption of the Westinghouse air brakes, so men didn't have to stand on top and turn the wheels, and the introduction of automatic coupling systems. Here in the top images, we see the dangerous practice of handbraking. And at the bottom, I'm showing the old Lincoln pin coupler mechanism that were respons was responsible for many injuries, even deaths, and what they called the Janney automatic coupler that allowed workers to step out of the way when the coupling was carried out. In 1875, the Rock Island and Pacific, Chicago Rock Island Pacific arrived and left Iowa City eastbound four times a day and also arrived and left Iowa City westbound four times per day. I didn't explain, but it had been taken over the Mississippi and Missouri by the Chicago Rock Island Pacific, if I didn't say that. Um, so they had that schedule. In 1878, the railroad announced this line has a full equipment of elegant dining and restaurant cars run only by this company. And to quote from the directory, it says, the means of communication at present between Iowa City and the outside world are the Chicago, Rock Island, Pacific, and the Burlington, Cedar Rapids, and Northern Railroads, which we'll get to shortly. Also in that directory, an ad for the railroad stated that the bridge across the Mississippi that had been completed in 1873 was 1,550 feet and six inches long. Six inches, mind you. The Rock Island Depot at Wright Street, the, the one that we know of today, was built in 1898, replacing the original one at South Johnson Street. And today it houses a law office and at least one other business. Some of the interior is still in the original state. The golden era of passenger service was in the 1930s and 1940s when the lightweight, diesel-powered, streamlined passenger trains were introduced. Accommodations included such things as air conditioning, reclining seats, adjustable footrests, sleepers, and elegant dining cars. To quote Irving Weber pertaining to travel by him and his wife, we appreciated the fine service, linen, tablecloth, and napkins, fine china, silverware, and a vase of flowers. Oh yes, the final touch of elegance, which I will never forget, was the silver finger bowl with its slice of lemon at the conclusion of the dinner. 
Passenger rail service to and fro Iowa City ended in 1970, if I have the date correct. And that same year, the federal government intervened to keep rail passenger service afloat in the U.S. by passing, uh, passing the Rail Passenger Service Act of 1970, which established Amtrak. Now, of course, we have to go about 45 miles to Mount Pleasant to catch the nearest passenger train. This is a look today at the railroad bank along the present Iowa Interstate Railroad line, which is it's now called, that traverses the East Iowa City neighborhood. The railroad has chosen to <clears throat> just dump the discarded ties down along the bank, which has quite an unpleasant odor of creosote. And I'm wondering if rainwater might can carry, con carry contaminants into Ralston Creek in the Longfellow neighborhood where it comes real close. Before the Mississippi and Missouri Railroad was organized, this one that I've been talking about that's undergone different name changes, another railroad was serving a route to run just north of Lyons, Iowa, which is north of Clinton, or was north of Clinton, Iowa, through Iowa City. It would collapse in infamy carrying the moniker the Calico Railroad. It was known as the Lyons, Iowa Central Railroad Company. It planned to go all the way to Council Bluffs, about 308 miles. And it's up there at the north end of Iowa City where it was being planned. There was a lot of grading work done in the Iowa City area. Evidence of that can still be seen near the St. Joe Cemetery and the Iowa City Community School Building, which was a former Iowa City Press Citizen Building on North Dodge. The story was that a, there was a Mr. H.P. Adams of Syracuse, New York, as one of the directors of the railroad. He was quite an eloquent speaker, influential guy, likable man, came through various Iowa counties encouraging the issuance of bonds. Well, he absconded with the funds and was later found to be a fugitive from justice. <laughs> when he pulled up stakes in Iowa, a large number of Irish immigrant workers and their families, probably 2,000 or so, were left stranded near Lyons. Most or all of the railroad bed between Lyons and Iowa City had already been completed. The workers were compensated in lieu of wages with groceries, dry goods, and other types of things. But even those things ran out before the workers were totally compensated, sated. Thus the derisive name of the Calico Railroad. And that's about the story on that. Now the BCRNN, or the plug line. In 1877, this line reached Iowa City as a branch off the Burlington Cedar Rapids and Northern Railroad. It was originally named the Burlington Cedar Rapids in Minnesota. Through the years, as one reads about railroad history, you get pretty confused with all of the takeovers and mergers and name changes. So it, to me, at least, it's quite confusing. The BCRNN was a north-south route that connected Burlington with Cedar Rapids with connections also to Minneapolis and St. Louis. A number of branch lines were built over the years, including the one to Iowa City. The, okay, so this, the line that ran in Iowa City was called the Plug, and it went from Iowa City to a rail crossing northeast of town, about eight miles, called Elmira. Some of you may have heard of Elmira, Elmira Road, which is still up there. And that's how you would get to Cedar Rapids by rail and other cities. Only two trains though ran each day, one in the morning, one in the evening, so not the best service. The station for the plug in Iowa City was at the present location of the Robert A. Lee Recreation Center on Gilbert Street, so it would be, the rec center might have been a little bit farther to the west there, but right about there, and this is what it would look like then today. So there was the, and then it ran down the hills. This is a view with a, a train pointing toward hills. And this is a passenger train leaving, heading to Elmira at about, oh, 1900 or so. At Elmira, there was a lunchroom hotel building. It was a pretty busy rail intersection in its day, actually. And here's the depot at Elmira. So the connection from Iowa City to Elmira, some manipulation was required. One way that they could do it would be to come up here from Iowa City and here and then back up and over onto this line and then go forward to Cedar Rapids like that. So it's pretty awkward. 
This is how the plug coursed through Iowa City. This is a 1900 map that shows that there was a separate community called East Iowa City that was later absorbed into Iowa City in 1910. So the plug line came through here, came down in the area of Jefferson Street, and then down past the new Pioneer Co-op, and down where I showed you by the rec center. On this 1960 map, we can see some of the plug rail line was still in place. I think it was serving a lumber yard principally at that time that was on um, Market or Jefferson Street. Eventually, it, uh, the Rock, Chicago Rock Island Pacific took over the BCRNN. Since the late 1870s, the Rock Island had a substantial interest in it. I uh, won't read the rest of it here, but the, the line was abandoned pretty much by the late 1920s. And the last year for passenger service on the plug was, I think, 1924. And by 1930, all the track had been removed between the eastern part of Iowa City and Elmira. Probably it was a line that really never earned its keep, is from what I read. It didn't uh, do, amount to very much economically. This is the original office building of the BCR and N in Cedar Rapids, as it looks today. This is a limestone structure that's near the New Pie Co-op, which you can see in the background there, that was put in by the railroad to reinforce the bank of Ralston Creek. So a lot of evidence exists of this railroad today if you look around. Uh, also, probably the rail lines having gone through here across the street. And I've been told this story many times that the old Lou Henry restaurant that's been known as many things is angled off right here because the rail line ran very close to the restaurant through there, so they built it in that fashion. And here is what, off of College Street, if you go on 7th Avenue north of Court and then turn west on College, this area that looks like an alleyway was the right of way for the railroad. And there it is as a summer view again with evidence of where the tracks had gone across there underneath. And this is uh, Court Hill Park, which is out on Friendship. Again, limestone structure from the railroad. Here's a, a rail that was probably taken up and just dumped into the creek or fell into the creek. And these blocks were part of it too, the, that I guess kids play on that have been put up there. And this massive limestone bridge structure is seen near the former site of Elmira. Now let's talk about the Crandick, which is a neat story. After its introduction, electricity was soon used to power rail cars. In the late 1880s, communities in many parts of the U.S. introduced local rail service with power supplied by overhead rail or electrical lines. The cars ran both within communities and between neighboring ones. Those running between towns were generally called interurbans, and those running within towns, streetcars. And of course, they were clean, pollution free. The automobile was in its infancy when these began, so they had a relatively long tenure before they met their demise. Eventually, I think the mass ownership and flexibility of the automobile killed most electric train travel. Of course, look what they still have in Europe in so many cities. So a lot of factors, no doubt. Economics, I suppose, is a lot of it. Somebody mentioned at, when I presented this at the Senior Center, well, you failed to mention that there was a big lobby um, by the automobile industry against the railroads that caused this to happen. Well, I don't know about that, but there were probably lots of factors, but it sure stands the reason that the automobile coming in was gonna kill off a lot of this rail service. Okay, now let's see. Before I get to this, I want to mention some things about the railroad here, but I can keep that up there. Uh, Captain Stephen L. Dowes in Murray, that's uh, the Dowes Institute of, of Dental Research name for him. And uh, Isaac V. Smith got the idea to incorporate an electric railway system as part of the Cedar Rapids Electric Light and Power Company. And this was not one of the first electric railroads in the country, but it brought forth some really significant innovations. 
There are a bunch of them that I'll mention here. But in 1901, Dowson Smith received a Cedar Rapids street, City Streetcar franchise with a connection to build an interurban railway between Sierra and Iowa City. 1903, the electric wire and bridge construction began under the name of the Cedar Rapids and Iowa City Railway and Light Company. The first interurban was run on August 13th of 1904 providing an immediate improvement in passenger travel, of course, over the old plug line. From the outset, the, the CRANDIC acronym for this, was it was primarily a passenger line, but they had freight cars right away that brought coal to Cedar Rapids. The CRANDIC founders chose alternating current. The big thing of the day was alternating versus direct current. The direct current was the Edison idea and alternating was Westinghouse. The Crandick was the first interurban in the nation that used 60 cycle rotary converters, the first that operated from lighting generators, the first to use automatic voltage regulators, and the first to install the very efficient and powerful narrow gap electric motors in its railroad cars. So that was pretty cool. Within 30 years, these innovations were standard in railway and streetcar operations throughout the U.S. And later, the interurban was extended from Cedar Rapids to Mount Vernon and to Lisbon. This is um, car number one, which was Crandick's first passenger car. There were approximately 27 miles of track between Cedar Rapids and Iowa City, as many as 60 stops. But the trains would stop just about anywhere. Someone would flag them down. They had 13 scheduled each way, making the 27 mile trip, <clears throat> however, 75 minutes. That was quite a bit of time. <clears throat> but think about maybe a, a car and a muddy road or something at that time if you had one. The line was on private right away except for the portions within each city. When the interurban was, rail bed was prepared on the west side, about 100 horses were utilized to help dig out the cut. The, the interurban town, I'm sorry, the interurban and the town of Swisher came into existence in the same year of 1904. No coincidence, the 200 acres of the Benjamin Swisher farm which was settled by Swisher back in 1841, <clears throat> were platted as the town of Swisher. There were Swishers in Iowa City, uh, and in conjunction with Mr. Dow's of the Interurban, they paid the Swisher estate $8,000 for the 200 acres of the farm. The right of way through the town was given as well as space for a depot for $1. Lots were auctioned off. On uh, June 22nd of 1904, before the electric cars were operating, a special steam train with four passenger cars came down the new interurban tracks and brought 300 Iowa Cityans in the, to the auction. 53 lots were sold that day, netting $5,400. That's how Swisher began. This is a 1910 U University of Iowa campus map showing how the Crandick line ran in the downtown Iowa City area. You know, made a loop, Washington and College Street area here. This is an, is an image of the Iowa City Interurban Ticket Office. Housewives could travel to the larger shopping venues now in, in Cedar Rapids using the Crandick, and school traffic was a significant source of revenue too. The rail line served the University of Iowa, Coe College, and Cornell College, going between all of those towns. One lady recounted the importance of the interurban tour. In 1915, her only means of transportation was a horse and buggy, <coughs> but the interurban allowed her to travel from Lisbon to Cedar Rapids and then to Iowa City to visit a relative in the hospital and then get back to Lisbon all in the same day. And as many as 300 gallons of milk often came down from a farm north of town to the Sidwell Dairy. I think that wasn't the, the one that Irving Weber was associated with. This, this was named the Milk Can Special. It would also pick up a few kids who were late to school. And there was um, especially heavy traffic on football Saturdays for the Crandick. And there was one noteworthy event that Irving Weber talked about in 1922. In November that year, 10,000 people reportedly had driven to Iowa City for the Iowa-Minnesota game. And then heavy rains came down during the game. The dirt roads in all directions were just quagmires. 500 cars between Iowa City and Cedar Rapids were stuck, leaving about 1,500 fans stranded. Some who were stuck close to the interurban tracks abandoned their cars, caught the trains to Iowa City and Cedar Rapids. Over the next couple of days, farmers with teams of horses pulled the cars out of the mud, 
Many of them were taken to North Liberty where they were loaded on flat cars and shipped to either Iowa City or Cedar Rapids. Traffic on the Cranda gradually increased throughout the 1920s. In 1926, 16 trains were scheduled daily providing hourly service. During the Depression years, passenger traffic declined sharply. So in 1932, only eight daily round trips were operated. But by 1937, they were back up to 10 per day. But by that time, the private automobile was becoming the predominant mode of transportation. In 1939, the Crandick bought six lightweight high-speed interurban cars from a defunct Iowa or Ohio rail line company. The cars were repainted and refurbished, and they could top 80 miles an hour. I don't know how fast they went in some of those segments with all those stops, but evidently they got up to a pretty good rate of speed. They were put in the service using um, mail, running mail, baggage and passengers. During the Second World War, gas rationing and rubber shortages curtailed private car use. So again, ridership was up and nearly 600,000 per year. That's about 1,600 a day. During the post-war years, again, ridership dropped dramatically until 1950, the, it dropped to less than 30,000. Yet there were still 12 daily weekday trains. Most riders were content to what they called swing and sway the Crandick way on a brightly painted galloping goose or yellow comet car that those who had a little too much to drink might refer to some of these cars as the vomit comets. <laughs> a young lady recalled, when I was in my first year at the university in, I think it was 1940, I rode the Crandick every day from Cedar Rapids to Iowa City, and on the way home from class, I often went to the back of the car and took a nap. Usually the operators let me know when they got to my stop, but once they forgot. I rode back and forth between Iowa City and Cedar Rapids until about 11 o'clock at night. In, in July 1952, they cut the service to six weekday trains and four Sunday trains. Also, service in downtown, downtown Iowa City was dropped and trains terminated at the Iowa City yard about a half mile from downtown. Just kept going down and down. The end finally came on May 30th of 1953. Last day of passenger service. Passengers got a souvenir ticket. They had dignitaries. A couple of not notable things were a Navy man on furlough arranged his furlough so he could be on the last ride. He's the one who came the furthest for the ride. And then there was actually a passenger named Al Alfred Scales of Iowa City who had ridden the first passenger train in 1904 and he was on this last train in 1953. By the end of 1953, the electric wires and poles along the line had been removed. Crandick locomotives were converted to diesel electrics and freight traffic began to boom. More than a half million tons were shipped that first year. Now, dropping back in time, I'm gonna talk about the final segment of passenger rail transportation, Iowa City, the streetcar. As I mentioned, the Crandick went into operation in 1904 and at the same time, there was talk of having a streetcar for service within the city. In, in, eight, I'm sorry, in 1908, the Rundell addition to Iowa City came about. Some call it Rundell. I've heard Rundell most commonly, so I'll use that. It offered 274 home lots. If 80 lots were sold, the Rundell Land and Improvement Company vowed to arrange for the financing of a streetcar into their new addition. In the spring of 1908, the city of Iowa City granted a franchise to practically all of the streets of Iowa City, which the company would consider most desirable to lay track on. On November 15, 1909, an Iowa City newspaper stated that if at least 80 lots were sold, a reliable bonding company would furnish sufficient funds to build the line. Between 1900 and 1910, I mentioned this rural subdivision named East Iowa City existed outside the boundaries of Iowa City. It runs between 1st Avenue and 7th Avenue. Oddly enough, numbered from east to west. You would expect it to be going the other way, but the fact that this was a separate entity helps explain that. 
Court Street, the railroad tracks are the other boundaries of East Iowa City. The Rundle addition would bridge the space between Iowa City and East Iowa City. I've outlined that in black right here. Getting ahead here, I'm just showing you where there's a manufacturing company here, but uh, electric streetcars weren't new to the state of Iowa. They went into service in Des Moines in 1888, so that was quite a while before that. This is the O.S. Kelly Manufacturing Company. Uh, you've known it as a different company most recently before it was torn down and converted into housing that manufactured plastic drain tubing. Yes, yes. yes. But this was built in 1899 and it produced farm implements and small gasoline engines. Its plant manager was a Mr. James H. Maggard for whom a nearby street was named. And Maggard was interested in establishing an electric street railway that would run to the plant. And he hoped this would also encourage people to buy lots in, in the Rundle edition, which is in this black area here. The company was known as the Iowa City Electric Railway Company, and Mr. Maggard was one of its directors. These lots were sold, and so the first streetcar line was built. This announced that, indeed, the lots had been sold. The streetcar line had been put into the service. They were encouraging citizens to buy more lots. This first streetcar line opened with the first car making the circuit November 17, 1910. The fare was five cents, which would buy you a scoop of ice cream or a Coke at that time. And in the beginning, the cars had a motorman and a conductor. Later, one man served both functions. This is the route of the first streetcar line. So it was running down Burlington Street, Muscatine, and then down Rundle Street. If any of you notice how wide Rundle Street is, it's because of the fact that the streetcar was running down the street. By 1915, four more streetcar lines were completed. I've kind of penned them in there. Before some of the routes were finalized, local merchants vied to have the lines run down their streets so shoppers could be dropped off right in front of their stores. This map shows how the streetcar system served the city of Iowa City. I've outlined in red the city limits up till March of 1910. And then, uh, on March 21st of 1910, a vote was put to the people of Iowa City and the rural areas in Johnson County whether to extend the city limits to the yellow lines. And it passed. And as a result, the city almost doubled in area. Although the streetcar did not serve all of that area out to the yellow lines, a lot of that wasn't developed really for quite a while. The streetcar company ran into financial problems, and in 1928, it was purchased by a Henry Negus, an Iowa City attorney who was one of the original stockholders. By the early 1900s, buses began replacing the streetcars. In fact, buses really started coming in uh, in the mid-1920s. This is um, showing the intersection of Washington and Dubuque Streets. And Irving Weber stated that the photo was taken in 1915. Bob Hibbs said it was 1925. Um, but what I want to point out is this point out is the so-called so-called go anywhere city bus on the left part right here. So bus routes were obviously a lot more flexible and more extensive than the rail lines were, so it provided keen competition. Here's an example of a mid-1920s bus on the top left there, and then I'm just reminding you here with this auto that uh, automobile ownership was increasing dramatically, of course providing very keen competition for the streetcar. Here are some interesting pleas from the streetcar company, which were from 1924 and 1925, saying that if you pick somebody up who's walking down the street, you're taking away from our business. So I was trying to... Uh, plea with them to please. So that's the story of the streetcar. Um, yes, I was going to mention that Bob Hibbs noted that Iowa City buses were 
traversing 124 miles of, of routes in, say, 2003, over 17 routes, compared to the former five lines of streetcars that were six miles. Mm -hmm. Of course, Iowa City got bigger, but not proportionally that much bigger. I, I think the year that streetcar ended service was probably 1931. I'm not sure if that's exact date, but that's about right. So what do we have for passenger service today in Iowa City? Since 2004, we've had the Hawkeye Express, which conveys football fans from Coralville to, did you see the recent article in the paper about some kind of graft or financial difficulties they've encountered with that? I don't know what that was all about. I think it's about a $12 round trip from Coralville to the stadium, which of course is pretty decent. I assume that they don't pay to park out there, is that right? by the, in Coralville, and you often pay $20, $25 to park in, say, University Heights or someplace to, to go into the game. So it's kind of fun to take a train ride, too. Shortly after the stadium was built in 1929, a siding was laid along the railroad adjacent to the stadium. A siding, the railroad people know, is a parallel rail line along a main line that allows the train to pull off so other trains can continue along the main line and they built four sets of wooden stairs leading from the tracks up to the level of the stadium. And football special trains also served the stadium until 1974 when the last trains ran from the Quad Cities. So, um, some of you have heard about a proposed passenger rail service in the Iowa City and through Iowa City along the Iowa Interstate <coughs> Rail Line, which is the train that holds us up on First Avenue by the Sycamore area, Sycamore in the Southeast Junior High. Um, well, at the present time, we've got a couple of uh, Amtrak services that go through Iowa. The one that goes through Mount Pleasant, then there's a little angled one down here. Uh, it doesn't serve the major cities of Iowa, of course. So a lot of people would like to see that changed. Iowa's been ex examining this expanded inner city passenger service since about 1996. A coalition, of Midwest, a coalition of Midwestern states known as the Midwest Regional Rail Initiative has been studying the feasibility and economic benefits of such a system. Then they issued a plan in 2004. A number of publications have come forth that um, talk about this proposed line. It's not intended that you read this, of course, it's just, my understanding is that Illinois has approved the plan and that passenger rail service will be brought to the Quad Cities in Dubuque. But thus far, Iowa has rejected the plan to carry the service through our state. Apparently, a large amount of federal support was offered as part of this deal, but there would also have been a lot of concomitant expense by Iowa and some significant annual maintenance costs. So I think it appears to be a dead issue, certainly with this administration. A lot of the people I've talked to uh, are on both sides of the fence on this, and many are not convinced of the need and feel that the added costs would place an added burden on our state, which I tend to agree with. But on the other hand, a lot of them have condemned our governor or legislature for their failure to approve the plan. So I don't know if it's totally dead, but with the present government, I don't think it's going to go forward. So to summarize, the, this very busy slide shows in the array of passenger rail lines that once existed throughout Iowa City. We've had quite a rich history of passenger rail transportation. Like most cities in the U.S., we've lost our, our means by which people can travel by rail. Some of the big cities still have well, Chicago, of course, has the L system with the hot rail down below. And do any cities have overhead rail transportation in the United States, Philadelphia, or any places? I think San Francisco has, well, they have BARDA, whatever. They have different passenger rail systems. But the political climate and economic considerations in the state are probably going to dictate whether future rail travel one day would return to Iowa City. But for now, it doesn't look likely. So that's it, and thank you. Yeah. You mentioned uh, the Westinghouse and the air brake. Are you aware that that was tested on the Burlington Hill? No. 
Yes. This, on Burlington Hill? Yes, I live in Mount Pleasant, and that's... Uh, you mean the town of Burlington? Yeah. West Burlington Hill. Yeah. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Wow. Is we that actually that have road, some... that, that windy road? Or, no, that's a different thing. That, in our collection are some movies shot by Mr. McMillan of those air, breast ta air brake tests that were, were made. Somebody huh. Yeah, I had a question. I had read something in the uh, newspaper recently about a former rail line between Solon and Eli that they're going to make into a bicycle path, and I was just wondering if you had any knowledge of that being a railroad at one time, because I didn't Marie, know anything about know? it. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's partly paved already. It was just a, uh, the Rock Island that ran down from Cedar Rapids um, and um, through Oasis and West Branch, and part of that is already completed. I don't know if they'll get the rest of it done. Good, thanks. Yes. Uh, I'm a East Side resident, and I hear at night the horns. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I hear the the horns around 1 a.m. Something like I don't know if it, about you guys, but um, I like the sound of trains. But where do they blow their horns, and where are they coming from? Where are they going? What is it that I'm hearing? I, I couldn't well, figure it out. You're hearing the Iowa Interstate line that goes just south of Southeast Junior High School. And it's all freight type of thing, a lot of corn sweeteners and different things. And it's, it's a pretty successful system since Iowa Interstate has taken it over. But they, they just, ha I don't know what their schedule is. But where, 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 where is it that they actually do the blowing of the horn? Well, Chicago you know? to uh, where? West, uh, Council Bluff probably, or something. Probably and crossing First yeah, Avenue, cross country, right? By, anyway. Yeah. 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 It is kind of neat to hear, and you can hear them a long ways off, it seems like, right? You live in East Iowa City. Yeah. I was wondering, where do they blow on the west side when they actually come from the river side or from First Avenue? You know where it runs along on the west side, too, down by the stadium and out in Coralville? Yeah. I don't know how many people are aware of it, but if you're a railroad engineer, one of your important duties is looking out along the track. You probably notice little white signs with a W on it. That's whistle. That means there's a crossing. Uh, so he doesn't have to, at night, he doesn't have to know anything about the terrain. I see. He just sees that whistle in the headlight, or a whistle sign, and he blows the whistle. That's neat. I ran across a book at the library that's all about signage on railroads that I checked out but didn't really get into too yeah. much. But there's a lot of There's nothing automated about it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. This library is just full of things about railroads. If you're interested in this topic, we have old railroad timetables. I've had genealogists figure out exactly how their, what train their family caught and whether they were on an overnight sleeper or not, just by huh. looking at schedules. We have photographs, we have all, maps, all kinds of rich things. We have a magazine called Iowa Heritage Illustrated, and the newest issue features some photographs of railroad depots in Iowa that were taken out about the time of the demise of the passenger rail service. And our upcoming right. issue of Annals of Iowa also features a scholarly article about railroads. So we've got tremendous sources here. We encourage you to come back. But thank you very much for coming today, and thank you, Dr. Schuline, for giving us this interesting talk. You're thank, thank you. Thank you much. Watching City Channel 4. On TV, online, on demand, on Facebook, and now on the go on your mobile device.